Spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's special Veterans Day edition of Tycoons of Small Biz. We are excited to have in studio today Adam Jackson, founder and CEO of 360 Privacy. I'm Austin Peterson, as usual, and my Dwight Schrute, if you will, assistant to the regional manager, Landon Mance, is here as well. Landon, as always, thanks for being here. I couldn't resist. I had to do it <laughs> there. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I, I uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Adam, we are so excited to have you in, in studio. I want to take a quick uh, second and just kind of recognize, you know, I mentioned this is the Veterans Day episode. Um, we want to dedicate this episode to all members of the military, but for me especially, I want to dedicate this to my brother that's a year younger than me, um, who is, uh, I was almost going to say, was a Marine, but you know the, the drill, once a Marine, always a Marine. Um, <clears throat> he and I took two different paths to the same outcome. The reality is um, he went into the military, and I went and did some missionary service for our church when we were both about the same age. And I remember very vividly a letter coming in and Landon, a letter is what we did before emailing a letter coming in to me in Belgium that said, can you tell mom that it's okay for me to join the Marines? And, uh, you know, it kind of just, I was the older brother and, and my mom was scared to death about him joining the military. Um, but the reality is I learned in those two years when I served abroad so much that made me who I am today. And the same thing for him in the military that made him who he is today. And, and really what it, what it leads us to is husbands and fathers that love God and love country and take care of our, of our families and teach them the importance of faith. And so we took two different paths to get there, but we're both at that spot today. And I couldn't be prouder to have him as my younger brother and, and couldn't be prouder to have you in today for our Veterans Day edition. Well, I appreciate the, the kind words. It's, it's definitely great to know there's, there's that kind of support out there. Yeah, we, we certainly appreciate your service and everything that you've done um, for our country. And so, you know, I'm excited to learn a little bit about your about your business, but we always start by having our guests tell us a little about, about themselves personally. So we'd love to hear kind of your story, how you got to where you are today, if you're married, if you have kids, those sorts of things, and, and, uh, and then we'll kick off the show from there. Yeah, so um, I grew up uh, one of six kids in southern Indiana, a uh, small town. It's probably 20,000 people. Uh, did all the normal small town stuff, played sports, uh, you know, got into a lot of trouble as a kid. Uh, ended up joining the, I did one year of college and, you know, couldn't really figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I ended up joining the Army at 19, uh, did some time in the infantry at, with the 82nd Airborne. And then from there, um, went through the Special Forces uh, qualification course and finished out my career there. Um, I, I did a trip to Afghanistan and then one trip to Jordan and then a deployment to kind of a, a combined trip to uh, Iraq and Syria. Very cool. Very cool. And, and when, when did you get out of the military and... So I got out of the military in 2017, early 2017, uh, kind of decided I wanted to get into um, the computer vision uh, space um, and some of the machine learning stuff that was going on at the time. So I, I started digging into that and built a platform to identify, previously identified bad actors trying to enter schools and churches or like uh, VIP sections of uh, big tours or, or things like that. Um, ended up running into some regulatory issues with the state of Tennessee. Uh, they classified that business as an alarm system. And so they basically said I had to go through the process of like doing what an ADT or somebody like that would do to install this uh, artificial intelligence system. 
while that was playing out, um, I ended up uh, pitching the product to Jason Aldean's camp in 2017. So Jason was, and that was August of 2017, Jason was standing on stage October 1st, 2017 at the mass shooting in Las Vegas. And so his tour manager remembered this former special forces guy who was good at computers and they needed to revamp their security posture. And so I ended up riding on a bus for a while uh, with Jason and kind of helping out his tour and looking at, you know, uh, different ways of, of approaching security for a big organization like that. I guess in, during that process, I got to meet a lot of country musicians that had issues with cyber stalkers and very real issues of kids getting texted, accounts being taken over. In, in one case, somebody's banking information was stolen. Um, they lost access to all their social media accounts. And so I ended up getting to talk to a few of these stalkers. Um, and, and so one of the most interesting experiences of my life was sitting down with these people that had wreaked chaos on these, these artists and interviewing them um, and you know figuring out what made them tick and, and why they did the things they did and how they did it. None of them were programmers, none of them were hackers. They just found personal information on the internet and were able to just wreak havoc with that information. Um, so I'll stop here for a second and just see if you guys have any questions on the little you know spiel I just did, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, I think obviously you, you're talking about the groundwork of, of kind of how you let, you know, were led to where you are today in, in, in founding the business. Um, but, you know, I, before we went on air, we talked a little bit about this uh, documentary that's out called The Social Dilemma, right? And, and the things that you're talking about kind of make me think of some of the things that I saw in that. And so obviously, if, if you or any of our listeners haven't seen that documentary, I recommend watching it and, and understanding exactly what kind of data is behind this and what they're doing with our data, which ultimately I think is, is kind of what led you to take this to the next level, right? I mean, this, this wasn't, you know, in the conversation we had a few weeks ago before we, we had you uh, come on the show, we talked about how, you know, you didn't anticipate starting this business. It just kind of worked its way into this business. And, and now I feel like you're you're providing a service specifically to people who have really high profiles, um, this protection that they need, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, I never intended for this to be a business. What, what ended up happening is I talked to one of these stalkers who like sh walked me through the entire process she went through uh, to, to get the cell phone numbers of this country megastar and, and his wife and phone, his kids' phone numbers and, how she was able to break into his banking and how she was able to take over social media. And what it really amounted to was she got on Spokio.com and looked at, you know, the street he grew up on, his mother's maiden name, um, his high school mascot, um, all that kind of stuff, and was able to answer his security questions on his email account. Um, and once she had access to the email account, she was able to get everything. And she reset all of his passwords, took over, you know, several million social media followers, had full control of all of his finances. Uh, and, and this girl was doing this from a Chromebook in a, you know, in a trailer. Um, she wasn't, you know, some educated hacker that did all this. And so I built a list of these sites that offered that kind of information. And I knocked all of our, our, the existing clients off of those sites. And within a month, all of the data had just repopulated. You know, every time somebody opens a new shopper loyalty card or signs up at a gym and gives their address and phone number, all of that information is being bundled and sold constantly. And every time you have one of those new transactions, a new profile pops up somewhere online. And so we ended up having to build some algorithms and bots to go out and search for that data. I still at that point didn't think it was a business until we looked up and had you know more clients than I could service by myself and and kind of started running from there. Adam, I got I got a question for you. Uh, and I, I apologize if I uh, asked this this question in a couple of different ways <laughs> throughout the interview, but um, you know, obviously your your time spent in the military, you've got a, some I assume some pretty unique skill sets. Um, and you talk about interviewing these, uh, these uh, you know, uh, not, not hackers, but these, uh, you know, stalkers, these, these creeps. So 
how, how do your skills from being in the military, how do you kind of translate that over to, uh, you know, interviewing these people to extract the information that you're looking to get from them? So, I mean, people are people in general. And so there are some similarities, but like interviewing a, an Arabic speaking Middle Easterner that's never been to school and, and might have like a flip phone is it's a really different experience than interviewing somebody that is in most cases truly mental, mentally ill, um, usually has some level of delusion um, tied into what they're doing um, or just kind of wants to watch the world burn. So as far as like, you know, body, reading body language and, you know, knowing how to look scary at the right time, that, that, those skills transferred really well, but it was this whole new crazy dimension of just sitting down with these people that, you know, do these things that violate the social contract and don't understand why it's wrong to do. Um, it was a whole new and really interesting experience. Yeah, so that <clears throat> so you talk about looking scary at the right time. That that reminds me, you know, this happens to me. I'm sure it happens to you. Probably doesn't happen to Landon. We'll you'll see here in a minute. But um, you know, every time I go to the store, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, I go through and I'm paying, and they they look at me and they say, "Are you military?" You know, they're wanting to give me a military discount, right? And it took me a while to figure it out. And this is why I know it happens to you, and probably doesn't happen to Landon they're looking at me and they're saying, that dude is badass, right? <laughs> like they look at me and they're like, that guy could kill me with his pinky finger. And so I know that happens with you. <laughs> Landon, we know it doesn't happen with you, right? Uh, all right. I, okay. Second, second blow uh, landed. I, I got this. Okay. All right. <laughs> Noted. Oh man. No, I, I, I mean, I think that, that, that Landon's right, though. I mean, it, it's obviously a very good question. And, you know, the reality is there are skills, of course, that, that carry over. But I, I wouldn't have thought about it the way that, that you just mentioned it, right? Because it truly is a different scenario, whether it's, you know, radical Islam that's trying to destroy America and wants to do that, you know, with everything. And like you said, they don't have any of the technology. They don't have an education in, for the most part compared to somebody who's mentally ill and you know, the way I envision it believes that, you know, you mentioned Jason Aldean, right? So we'll use his name. Jason Aldean is meant to be her future husband, right? You know, like there, there are people who d live in that delusional state. And so it's a completely different approach, of course, but uh, you know, the skills I'm sure carry over and, and uh, I think it's probably enjoyable for you to, to work on this and to be able to put skills that you learn in the military to use in building a great company today. Yeah, I'd say the biggest, to, to sum it up, the, the, the biggest difference I would say is, is the motivation and the level of organization of thought. And so you deal with a really smart kind of manager of other terrorists um, and, and there's a level of organization to his thought process. There's a coherence to, you know, his belief system is broken, but it's driving a coherent thought process. Whereas when you sit down with these kind of almost, you know, almost insane people, uh, there's no organization. There isn't like the one thread that's sort of pulling the thought process across whatever finish line they're trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's basically the story on how the company got started, right? Right. So knowing your background in the military, I'm going to, I'm going to move to this question because the military, it's always about the team, right? So yeah. we'll come back and we'll talk about your competition and what makes you guys unique, but tell me, tell us a little bit about your team. We've met one member of your team, Zach, who's not able to be here today because he just had a baby. So congratulations, Zach. We hope that everything's great there. And that's way more important than being on our podcast. Um, and, and what we know of Zach is he's a really, really great guy, also an ex-military guy. But tell us about the team and tell us what, uh, what they do for your company today and, and makes, what makes you guys successful. Yeah, so the, the core of our company is, is former special operations guys. Um, we're, we're branching away from that because it turns out that uh, like Green Braves aren't great at like client services and, and answering customer complaints and, and things <laughs> like that. Um, and so we've had to fill those roles with people that have uh, more nurturing backgrounds than most of our team at this point. But um, yeah, the, the core of the group is, is former special operations and 
it's it's been really fun to try to translate the culture of a team room to you know in the army at Fort Campbell um, to a tech company in like East Nashville uh, where we've got like you know just a, a whole different operating environment but trying to to translate the same culture has been honestly it's been really fun uh, to to go through that process. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly that's one, it's a big struggle that small businesses have, you know, and, and trying to put together a team and keep that culture and keep everybody rowing in the same direction is it's not an easy thing to do, right? Um, and like you said, you've kind of already identified that, uh, you know, Green Beret or Special Ops are, are, not, typ are not typically the, uh, the best client service associates in, inside of an organization. Um, so, you know, you're learning some lessons along the way, but, you know, it, it's, so it reminds me of a guy that I, that's in a Vistage group of mine who's also former military. And, you know, he's very just straightforward, you know, very uh, uh, direct kind of a guy, right? Which most military guys are. Um, but he's built a great organization because he does understand how to get a team behind what it is that he's doing, right? So talk to us a little bit about how you bring that military aspect of, you know, getting a team all going in the same direction, having a mission and accomplishing that mission. Uh, and how do you translate that to 360 privacy? So I'd say the first thing is picking the right team. You know, it, it's, it's really easy to get people motivated. that are already motivated people and people that are mission driven are always going to get behind that mission as long as it's articulated to them why it's an important mission and they understand it and believe in it. And so the first thing we do is we have sort of a unique interview process. You know, I don't know how the interview process scales, um, but it's, you know, come to the office and hang out for a little bit before we ever, you know, go into a room and sit down with our HR check checklist and, and all that good stuff. Um, the biggest challenge we have as far as picking people for our team is having, is bringing people in that understand the really unique environment where um, you know it wouldn't be uncommon for you know voices to get raised, and you know um, that's just sort of the, the environment we all grew up in of really direct communication um, and and very uh, feedback that's more intense than what most people are used to. Um, and again, you know, in, in our in the world that most of us came from, that's fine. An hour later, everybody's great. Uh, in the world that a lot of 24 year olds are used to today, that is a, you know, crushing, traumatizing experience. And so making sure that we're bringing people in that fit the culture is, is the first step. The other is, you know, I think the mission that we are on is, is pretty easy to articulate and for people to get behind, right? Like we're making sure that really bad people can't find uh, people um, on the internet. And that's, it's not like we're, you know, selling widgets from, you know, from a company to a company to a consumer and, you know, it's a supply chain play. Um, our mission is not really hard to get uh, big groups of people behind. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's cool. Well, Landon, you want to jump in? I, you kind of raised your head like you were going to say something. Um, no, well, yeah, I, I, I was, but I lost my, my train of thought. Um, so I, I guess I feel like I have several questions, but the one that I, I want to just kind of address because it's pertinent to what, what you're talking about right now is, um, you know, being that you, you've put together this team, uh, maybe it's a fair statement to say mostly former military guys and gals, but also some, some uh, non-military, you know, ex-military people. Um, how does having that, that group, um, you know, how, do, how would you say that kind of helps to set your company apart, you know, from the competition that may not have a team as a, you know, with similar backgrounds to you? I'd say the first, the first is, is just having a really mission driven environment where the most important thing in our office every day is, is the mission that, that we're trying to accomplish. So, an example of that is a couple of weeks ago, we had a surge of enrollment. Um, so we had a bunch of clients coming in one day, required a lot of processing. There was never a conversation about, hey guys, we're all gonna stay until nine tonight because 
you know, this is what we have to get done. The job wasn't done, so everybody just stayed. There was no manager driving that. There was no uh, internal meeting to discuss staying late and approving overtime. It, it was just something that needed to happen, so it happened. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest benefit. The other is um, under, you know, the, the ability to give that direct feedback without having to have seven or eight meetings to make sure that the feedback was received and that you know, HR filled out the right forms to you know, allow uh, an employee improvement program or something along those lines. Just being able to communicate as directly as we communicate just cuts out so much time from the normal process. And then maybe this actually might be the biggest thing is everybody that's providing our product on our customers or on our, on our services team has gone overseas and been really worried that some bad actor was going to get on one of the sites that we deal with and find their family back home. And so they truly understand uh, the fear the client has when they come to us and ask us to start removing their personal information from a bunch of different sources. Yeah. Understood. Understood. I can't relate to that, but yeah, I can, I can certainly imagine. So you said that the mission of the company is, is essentially to um, remove information online. So bad people don't find it. So talk to us a, a little bit more about, about that. Like what, what is it that you guys are actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve, you know, your, your mission? Yeah, so we'll, we'll define the problem set a little bit more just so people understand what is actually out there about them. Um, there are about 25 sites that will sell the first five digits of your social security number, uh, of anybody's social security number in America. And, and the only bar that somebody has to, to hurdle to get um, to get that information is having a credit card. Um, they don't need to be a PI, they don't need to be law enforcement, they just have to sign up and then they search your name and they have the first five digits of your social security number, your home phone number, your home address, your cell phone number, and a whole list of your relatives. Um, in reality, if, if we were to you know, have a breach and that information were to go out in the public, that would be considered a, a very major hack, right? Um, that's something we would have to alert all of our clients about. We'd have to provide identity protection, but these sites just sell it without any, you know, there's no, there, there's no uh, recourse for anybody. So what we do is w in some cases, we will just click the opt, we'll go through the, the prescribed opt-out process on the site. A lot of sites have just a click here to remove your information. About two thirds have that. The other third, um, there's some sort of creative process. We've either you know, established a relationship with a company or, or through some other means are able to get them to suppress the information so that when somebody comes to the site and searches for our clients, they're not able to find their personal information. And so, then on the I'm back, sorry, go, go ahead. On the back side of that, there's a daily scan that happens for all of our clients to make sure that their information isn't being repopulated because they re-register their car or remove their driver's license, or in some cases, even just pay the water bill. So these companies that you, that, that provide this service, is what they're, is, is that legal for them to be selling this information like this? It shouldn't be, but it is. So the, the, the rules are, the, the problem is, or the fundamental problem is America views public records as being owned by the public. And so the government can't suppress somebody's right to use or access something that they own. And so these sites are operating under that law. Um, and so it is legal at this point to sell somebody's social security number on the internet as long as you just call yourself a data aggregation site and wave the First Amendment flag. Interesting. Unfortunate, but interesting. Um, oh, yeah. So as you were, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, someone getting their car registered or doing some other, you know, some other uh, task like that that may populate your public information. So I guess as somebody that uh, 
uh, is not uh, familiar with, you know, the, the celebrity world and the inner workings of all their stuff. So you're telling me that, you know, a, a big name celebrity, I mean, they still have to register their car at the DMV just like you or I do? So it's interesting. Um, you know, some, some do, some have an accountant do it and it's registered at their business manager's office or in some cases their family office or, or whatever the case may be. The problem is like even like using a house as an example, even if you buy a house in an LLC and a trust owns that LLC and you know you put all these layers of protection in place. We just had a client who um, the only place she had ever used her uh, real address was when she signed up her workouts at Orange Theory Fitness. Um, and so we're almost positive that we can track 280 sites populating her home address back to uh, Orange Theory Fitness. And so even, even if you have, you know, all the, the sophisticated measures in place, the life, the life practices that would go into keeping your information off of these sites are so cumbersome that most people don't just, most people just can't keep up with them. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, what I think of is first, it's kind of unfortunate that your company even needs to exist, right? Because the right. reality is it's, it that information shouldn't be out there. It shouldn't be accessible, right? And and I get the celebrity side of things and and they probably need it more than Landon or I or you know our normal day-to-day -day people, right? Jo Johnny Lunchbucket or whoever it is. But um, you know, you mentioned guys that you served with that worry about bad actors finding out where they live, right? And, and although I never served in the military, obviously my brother did, but a good personal friend of mine that I, that I was a missionary with from 1996 to 1998 was in the military afterwards. He's a West Point grad and he retired from the military as one of the top snipers in, in all four branches of the military. He had all these confirmed kills and a bounty on his head from Al Qaeda. So that makes me think, you know, he legitimately had something to worry about there. And so I kind of wonder if part of your plan going forward is to put together some sort of a service that could be to the masses, right? So military would still be considered the masses. These are not people who can afford to put together and pay for a, you know, a top of the line service like you're providing right now. Any, any chances that you're going that direction in the future, some sort of a contract with the military or for people like us? Yeah, so I'm gonna to say let's start here, start kind of back at the starting point. The only reason our price points are so high is because the service costs so much to provide at this point. These sites put in all sorts of protective measures to make sure that this process can't be automated or it's extremely hard to automate. Um, new sites pop up constantly, and so the cost of, su uh, of supplying a service like this is, is pretty high. Um, and as far as a mass service offering, um, you know, I think that's something that we're talking about doing internally right now. Uh, but the mechanics of that would actually be a pretty heavy technological lift. Yeah, I mean, it, so you hear commercials for companies who claim to be doing something similar, but it must be at a much lower scale than what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so we have two competitors. One covers about 70 sites. Um, the other covers, I, I think they're up to like 100 now. Um, and the, the only follow-up they do is quarterly. And typically there's no... Um, there's no uh, intelligent part of that. It's a, it's a, or an automated part of that. It's a human overseas that, that goes through and manually checks for, uh, you know, the, the client's information on the 70 or 100 sites that these companies are covering. Gotcha. All right. Well, let, let's take a quick break to hear a word from one of our sponsors, and then we'll come back. And I'm just so intrigued by by this whole process. And, and uh, it scares me to death knowing how much of my information is out there as well as my kids and, and that sort of thing. So let's take a quick break and we'll come back and talk some more if that's all right. 
Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back to the show. We are here with Adam Jackson, founder of 360 Privacy. And we're talking about things that should make every one of us scared and nervous about the fact that our uh, personal information is out there. So I um, want to jump in, actually. Landon, I don't know if you've got something you want to ask. Maybe you should ask a question here. Yeah, so I, I would be curious, um, Adam, to, to know the extent of the information that is out there on us, because uh, you know, you talk about email and home address and phone number and stuff, but you know, what, what, what all information is out there on, on you know, on a, any given person? Yes. Yeah, so it, it depends on the level of sophistication of the person, as far as the financial instru instruments they're using and things like that. But, um, so a basic rundown is almost always we will find a, um, a person's actual cell phone number, their actual home address, at least the first five of their social. In about 20% of cases, we'll find the, the entire social available and just open source. But then you get into sort of the, the soft identifiers. And so like, if you don't configure your Amazon wish list correctly, uh, then it winds up on all of these aggregation sites. And I don't think we've seen a, an Amazon wish list yet that didn't have something that embarrassed the person whose who's wish list it was. Everything from the wildly inappropriate all the way to, you know, just embarrassing books or movies or, or stuff like that. Um, and so then you look at like vehicle VIN numbers, for example, and what can be done with a, vehicle, a vehicle's VIN number. Um, I mean, you can, you can call a dealership with a VIN number and say, hey, this is my car. Um, I lost my key. This is my name. Can you make a copy? I'll swing by and pick it up. In a lot of cases, you can disable a car through its OnStar system if you have a VIN number for it. Um, and, and so to me, the VIN number being available, and that's sold directly from the DMV to aggregation sites or aggregation companies. Um, you know, there's the since COVID started, the amount of information we've seen and the types of information we've seen have grown almost exponentially because you have a lot of out of work software developers, you have a lot of companies that are trying to replace revenue streams and it's a fast, easy way to do that. That's crazy. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So Landon's Amazon wish list that has the poster in there for Miley Cyrus, number one fan. <laughs> that's, those are the types of embarrassing things you're talking about. Yeah. And, and you know, for Landon, that's, that's embarrassing. His friends are going to make fun of him. But you know, when, when the CEO of a Fortune 500 company has like how to stop a mental breakdown once it starts, all of a sudden you get into some very real ramifications for something that seems very innocuous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a publicly traded company, that could, you know, kill the stock price. I mean, that could, I mean, there's so many things that kind of go into that. That's that's a very good example, a real world example for sure. So what is it that gets you out of bed? every morning, Adam, what excites you about what you're doing? The fight, um, these, these sites feel like they have a right to take your private information and put it on the internet and then make it nearly impossible for somebody to, to get that information off. And so, you know, I'm still, even as the CEO of a company, I'm still involved in figuring out how to beat these sites. Uh, because that's, that's the thing that, you know, gets me excited is, is that fight with somebody that is doing something that's unjustifiable, making, trying to justify it, and then making it impossible for somebody to protect themselves. Yeah. So obviously you can hear kind of the military aspect of that, right? I mean, I think it probably started early on, like you said, in the beginning with competitive sports and those sorts of things that led to the military and then special operations. And now it's, you know, you've, you've transitioned who your enemy is, so to speak, but you're still excited about getting up and, and fighting the good fight, which I think is awesome. For sure. I got a question for you, Adam. Um, 
so uh, you know, you, you've been in, in business now for, for a little while and you've built this, you know, really cool, you know, team and this really cool, you know, service, but share with us, you know, what, what have you learned about business, you know, since you started, officially started the company, you've hired some people, you've built out a team, you've built up your client list. Talk to us just about what you've learned just generally, you know, about business and maybe some of the things that you didn't anticipate that you've had to work through and just kind of share some of your successes and failures with us, if you know, if you don't mind. Yes, that's a broad question. Um, I, I'd say the, the biggest thing I, I probably about business in general that I've learned is, um, you know, we, we made some team, some, some changes to our team uh, in the middle of, of this year and saw uh, results, you know, all measurable results, whether it was revenue, quality of the product, uh, happiness of, of the rest of the team uh, skyrocket. And that was sort of a wake up call of, you know, um, personnel management is probably the single most important function of, of anybody running a business. Um, you know, a couple of people that are in the wrong spot or, in the, you know, or just disgruntled in general uh, can, can really have huge dramatic effects on the direction of a business or, or even its viability. Yeah, I I just finished uh, listening to an audio book, which I highly, highly recommend. Uh, the book is called What It Takes, and it's essentially the the story of uh, Stephen Schwartzman, who is the co-founder of Blackstone, which is the largest call investment company, I believe, in in the world. I think they own more real estate than any other firm in the world, and they do m a work and private equity deals and they, they're just they're investors and I, I think they've got 500 billion of assets you know under their their management and uh really great read or listen depending on how you want to do it but one of the points that that he makes is he says that uh um you have to hire tens because tens will always find the answer to the problems that they are facing. And uh, I, I thought that that was a really good lesson. And, and speaking of you know, hiring tens, uh, my first hire, Adam, was uh, uh, a, a woman who also is a West Point grad. She served in the army and uh, did a couple of tours overseas. And uh, she has been, uh, just an absolutely incredible um, employee. But anyway, the point I'm making is that uh, in, this, in this book, you know, he talks about the tens and it sounds like you've kind of, uh, uh, you've kind of found that, that same concept applicable to your business, which is, and Austin has kind of spoken to this in the past, you know, talking about, you know, make sure that the, the right, the people are on the right seats of the bus and everyone's heading in the same direction. So it seems like you, you've kind of figured that out maybe with some of your recent hires. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll find out, you know, it's, I think mean, it's a little early to tell with, with recent hires, but um, we, at least we're, we're, I think we're moving in the right direction on it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, the, the, the future. You know what? What are what are some of the you know the aspirations for you and for the firm? You know the next uh, you know three, five, ten years, or just any time in the future. What 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 are your plans? Yeah, so I mean, at a really high level, um, you know, running this company is still really really fun for me right now, um, and the company is still growing. And, and as long as those two things are, um, as long as those two things stay true. Um, everything else is just sort of gravy as far as, you know, are we going to take path X or path Y? Um, that being said, we, we've rolled out, we've up to this point, we've been completely focused on individuals. Um, we just rolled out a uh, corporate pricing plan and we've gotten some really, really good traction early on with, with that program. Um, I think, you know, we, we anticipate we'll probably add 
we'll increase the number of employees we have by 50% over the next probably quarter to two quarters. Um, and so we're trying really just kind of managing growth, but still um, having a lot of fun and making sure that growth makes it more fun. You know, in a startup, everybody's wearing nine hats and they don't like two of them. And so the way we, the way we're going to, the way we hire is, you know, everybody writes the hats that they don't want to wear on a, on a whiteboard anymore. And then we go looking for somebody that wants to wear those hats. Um, and so, you know, as long as you man, as long as we manage the growth correctly, um, you know, things should get more and more fun as we grow. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it actually even goes back to the the last question that Landon asked, um, and you talked about you know adding to the team or reshuffling the team and that sort of thing. And you know, it one thing that I always try to remember is hire slow, fire fast, right? So you got to make sure that you're getting that right person, like Landon said, on the bus and in the right seat. But if if you made a mistake, don't let that mistake sit there forever. Just deal with it and move on because it's critical to your to your company and your your clients come to expect excellence from you and if you can't provide that excellence from whatever employee then that reflects poorly on the company yeah for sure yeah so this is kind of a different way of asking the the same question that landon just asked but one of the things that that we plan with our clients for all the time and we've mentioned this multiple times on the on the podcast is um Stephen Covey always says, begin with the end in mind, right? And so if you had to fast forward 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, whatever it is for you that seems, you know, your long-term goal, what is the ultimate goal for you and this company? Is this something you see doing forever? Do you plan on there being an exit and you doing something else? Kind of what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean... You know, I think any company that starts out on day one saying like we want to sell in the next 36 months, like I can't imagine that ever goes well. Uh, I, maybe it does on Silicon Valley, but I just can't imagine building a company with sort of that end state. So I, right now, what what I you know we're completely focused on, and, and I don't see changing anytime soon, is improving our existing products, finding a way to make people's personal information online and uh, find better and, and innovative ways to protect people constantly. Um, and, you know, as, again, as long as we're growing, it's a viable business and everybody involved is still having a lot of fun. That's, that's sort of the, you know, if that's my 20 year end state, I'm, I'm thrilled with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's cool. I mean, it, it's one of those things that I tell my clients too, as, as corny as it sounds, I put my head on my pillow at night knowing I'm doing something that makes the world better. Right. And, and makes people's lives better. And, I think it's easy for you to see that that you're doing the same thing, which makes it easy to get out of bed in the morning and, and go and fight the good fight. For sure. So I've got one final question. Maybe Landon can wrap it up after that if he has another question. But the, the final question I have for you is for those who are listening to the podcast today and, you know, or obviously that gets shared with, with your social media and, and what you're trying to do to grow the business, what should a potential prospect of your company know about your company that they don't know already? Uh, that, that we take privacy and security, uh, I, I think, more seriously than any other company that, that I've ever heard of. So, you know, we, we don't operate in the cloud. Um, we, the way we store our customer data vastly exceeds any sort of, you know, industry standard, whether it's SOC 2 or, or whatever certification you can have. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, we are constantly improving our product. And that's, in this industry, it's, that's pretty rare. Um, last, in, it, oh, since COVID started, I think we've added 41 sites to our total list of sites that we cover. And there's no, we don't go back to a customer and say, hey, we're deleting you from 20% more sites because COVID started. And, you know, there's, there's more information out there. So you have to pay us more. Um, it's just, you know, that gets added to the list. We have a, a big day where we go back and delete all of our clients from those sites, and then we move on. Uh, but you know, our product is is constantly iterating, um, and the people that are looking out for you, you know, all of a sudden you you go from this huge expansive problem to having like a team of former special operations guys and cyber experts uh, working to make sure that you know your information can't be found online. Yeah. That's, 
that's awesome, man. You got you got a great story. Um, I don't have any further questions for you. I just want to share something with you. Um, you know, Austin and I are I, we've communicated this to you um, prior to today, but we are huge supporters of our service men and women. And so we just want to say thank you very much for uh, for your service. Uh, we certainly wish you the best of of luck in your in your future endeavors. And before you share with our listeners and everybody where they can track you down, uh, I just want to uh, tell you that Austin and I uh, we're going to make a hundred dollar contribution to the Gary Sinise Foundation. Adam, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. But uh, that's a foundation that uh, myself and my family have been donating to for a number of years. And he does some incredible work for uh, ex-military people. So uh, we're going to make a $100 donation to that foundation, uh, kind of uh, just as a, uh, a show of our appreciation to, to you and all the other men and women that uh, serve this country. So thank you. That's huge. Yeah. Thank, thank you guys for doing that. That's, um, you know, again, knowing that support is out there is, is I think huge for current and, you know, past, uh, service members. Yeah, absolutely. So can you share with us, uh, in our, in our listeners, uh, I, I know you, you guys kind of, uh, fly, fly under the radar a little bit, uh, by design, but, uh, if people wanted to look up your company and get a little bit of additional information on you guys, uh, where, how do they, how do they find you? They can go to either 360privacy.com or the only social that we're on right now is LinkedIn. And, and I think we'll probably stay that way for a while. Okay, awesome. Well, Adam, we uh, really, really appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll, you'll get a little bit of time to, to maybe relax and uh, to kind of take the day off tomorrow. Maybe not, I don't know. But uh, Anyway, we, we look forward to hearing about your future success and we'd love to you know, have you back on the show maybe a, a year from now to hear about uh, what you're up to. Sounds great. Thanks for awesome. having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. All right. So I didn't get a chance to mention it on the on the program. First of all, great 